My eyes are forever turned towards the Lord, for he shall release my feet from the snare. Look down upon me and have mercy on me. As we have just heard in today's gospel, we learn from the Apostle John that Jews, as he says, have no dealings with Samaritans. The statement reflects the firm conviction among the Jewish people that the Samaritans practiced a debased form of adulterated Judaism, if you will, which included intermarriage with Gentiles. Samaritans were considered, therefore, ritually impure and unclean. Thus, normally a Jew who used a drinking vessel after a Samaritan had touched it, let alone drunk from it, would have been or become impure, ritually impure, ceremonially unclean. Furthermore, we are told by John, <coughs> excuse me, that it was about noon, and there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. If you know anything about the habits of that part of the world, certainly at the time of our Lord, but even today in some places, water is still drawn from wells. And women are usually the ones that come out with vessels to, to draw that water for the family and for the residents or the home. But they always do it in the early hours of the morning when it's cool and in the late hours or the early hours more accurately of the evening when it is also cool. This woman, we have, a, we have a, a hint as to why this is the case, but this woman is coming at noon in the heat of the day all by herself with nobody else around. And that is because she is, even by the standards of the Samaritans who adhered to the first five books of Moses, she is really living an immoral life and has. And so she is an outcast amongst her own Samaritan people. It is she that comes to the well. She is, of all people, certainly in human terms, and this would be the view of the disciples, the most unfit and unlikely candidate to become a follower of his. And it is to her that Jesus says, sitting on Jacob's well, outside of Sychar, give me a drink. She's very surprised by this, because by his dress, she knows he is a Jew. And she says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. How is it that you ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And Jesus responds, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman responds, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. It's at that point, it's after this encounter with Christ, and he's begun the conversation with her, that he puts the finger on really the moral dimension of her life <clears throat> by asking her a straightforward question, or giving her a straightforward command, really. Go and call your husband and come here. And of course, this causes her to respond, really kind of evading this area of her life. Well, I'm not married. I don't have a husband. Very quickly, very abruptly. And Jesus says, well, you have spoken truly. You have had five husbands, and the man you're now living with is not your husband. Now, what Jesus is touching on here is certainly a need in her life for genuine repentance, contrition, and penance. But I want to underscore the fact that the contrition and penance are not the final point, not the end, but the necessary means to an intimate, personal relationship with him, with Jesus, which, whether she knew it or not, she had been thirsting for her entire life. 
And may I say in parentheses here, this is precisely the point that Pope Francis has been making again and again and again, misinterpreted as the press, as though he's laying aside the moral dimension of our faith. He most certainly is not. But what he is doing is saying, the encounter with Christ comes first. And then we have a basis to deal with the moral dimension of our lives. Anyway, continuing with our current gospel, I am reminded of Dante's comedy, which begins in the Inferno with midway in our life's journey. I went astray and from the straight road and woke to find myself alone in the dark wood. How shall I say what wood that was? I never saw so drear, so rank, so arduous a wilderness. Its very memory gives a shape to fear. Death could scarce be more bitter than that place. But since it came to good, I will recount all that I found revealed there by God's grace. The encounter between the sinful woman of Samaria and our Lord Jesus Christ, who is without sin, is not finally about her immoral life or even her sin or the punishment she knew in her heart of hearts she deserved, but rather it is about her having gone astray, about finding herself lost in the subsequent wilderness of her soul, the desolation of her interior life, meeting the marvelous provision of God's merciful and providential grace in the person of the Son of God. As uh, St. John the Apostle writes, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In Jesus, whose name means Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, she meets the font of all that is truly beautiful, good, and true. And he has come to her both geographically and spiritually. In him, she encounters God's love for her which beckons her to love him and thereby to satisfy the thirst of her soul. Specifically, her mind, her intellect, was being presented with him who is infinite in holy goodness, eternal beauty, in truth incarnate, the way, the truth, and the life, eternal life. Her heart, her will, was thereby invited to choose, was being invited to love truly, but to choose him, who is the font of eternal life, was to simultaneously turn from her sinful way of life, which had become for her a living death. Jesus was saying to her, begin this day to live for the greatest good, the greatest love, far more beautiful than anything you have known before, a love which will finally satisfy the thirst of your soul. Begin this day to live for me. This season of the church's year is meant to remind us that this life is a Lenten journey, a journey which, for all of us, is informed by a pattern. Through God's merciful providence, our minds, our intellects, are presented time and time again with the good, the beautiful, and the true, with Jesus the Savior of the world, because God does not wish that any should be lost or perish, but for all to come to repentance. And our hearts, our wills, are thereby invited to choose, which is always about love. At those times in our lives, each of us, in truth, is the woman in today's gospel, meeting and being confronted by Jesus at the well of our own self-made desolation and desperation. During those tender moments, and they will not always be there, during those tender moments, Dante's words give shape to our experience. I never saw so drear, so rank, so arduous a wilderness, which is not chiefly about externals or circumstances, but about the human heart in rebellion against God and the subsequent condition spiritual desert of our souls. And we may, for a while, blame God himself 
for that wilderness, asking childishly, why have you done this to me? If we, however, are to grow in our faith and become as did the woman at the well, truly his disciple, we eventually realize that it is not God who has done this to us, but we who, through our own willfulness, stubbornness, and rebellion, and sin, have done it to ourselves. God in his providence permits it, of course, but we are the cause of our spiritual desolation and unhappiness. But this encounter between our sinful selves and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the sinless Savior, is not finally about our desolation or even our sins, our penance or our punishment, all of which we deserve, and the recognition of which on our part is necessary. When all is said and done, it is about Jesus. It is about love incarnate, that terrible and wonderful love of God, which in Christ crucified beckons us and by his grace enables us to respond to him who, as Paul teaches us in our second lesson, while we were yet sinners, died for us. Behold, then, the crucifix. Behold his love for you. In the words of the poet, see from his head, his hands, his feet, love and sorrow flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown. And gazing upon this amazing sacrifice, our Lord lovingly beckons you to respond. And your response, by his grace, should be, again, in the words of the poet, were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so, demi excuse me, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my own. This was precisely the response of the woman of Samaria as well as other Samaritans in today's gospel. Is it yours? Will it be yours? The Holy Eucharist, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, is always a Jacob's Well experience for somebody, for many somebodies really, but only those who know that they are thirsting for the living God. They know that they are therefore finally in that place of desperation where they are ready to turn their backs and abandon their sin, which they thought would bring them happiness, but has not, and embrace him, or more accurately, be embraced by him. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is where our Lord, as both victim and priest, offers himself as an emulated victim for our iniquities, those very sins we cherished, and sheds his blood mystically for the remission of those sins. It is where the river of life from the font of his wounded side ever flows, for this is where the substance of the bread and the substance of the wine are changed transformed, transubstantiated into the substance of our Lord's broken body and the substance of his most precious blood. And whether we receive him in one species or the other, we receive the whole Christ. It is here in the midst of the Lenten wilderness of our lives that our Lord from the cross, from the midst of this holy sacrifice, continues to proclaim, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My eyes are forever turned towards the Lord, for he shall release my feet from the snare. 
Look down upon me and have mercy on me, for I am abandoned and destitute. To 